Yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, welcome. Uh, we'd like to welcome you as our audience to the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival and to a very, very special screening. Our motto is FLEF, uh, a different environment in every iteration that that means, both in creating a different environment here in Ithaca for the screening of films and imagining a different environment in the future and thinking differently about the environment. Um, I am uh, Patty Zimmerman. I'm the co-director of the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival. I'm also a professor of uh, film studies at Ithaca College. Uh, today is a really, really special screening of uh, what do polar bears dream when they're dying. And it's special for a whole lot of reasons. Uh, first of all, it's free. And I need to tell you why it's free. It's free because Mr. Smith's time in Ithaca is being supported quite generously through a grant to the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival from the National Science Foundation and from ARCUS, the Arctic Research Consortium of the United States. They are committed to bringing researchers, scholars, uh, artists, and Nubiat peoples down to the lower 48 to create community dialogues around the complex issues in the Arctic. We are very, very honored because for our festival, it's our very first National Science Foundation grant. I need to explain a little bit about this. Uh, as part of the National Science Foundation grant to bring Mr. Smith here, the um, uh, Science Foundation were asked that we create a tour for Mr. Smith that included outreach through K through 12. So as part of the festival, Mr. Smith and his polar bears have been at three schools in Ithaca. And I'd like to give a particular shout out to the schools and teachers who helped make that possible. And I need to say, it's the first time in the 14 years of the festival's history that we've been able to get a filmmaker and a topic into the public schools. And I think there's nothing better than the words NSF and polar bears to get kids and teachers interested. So I particularly like to thank uh, my colleague, Allison Pritz, raise your hand, uh, South Hill School, which featured Mr. Smith. screening Mr. Smith ever had of the great intellectual force field of first and fourth graders. <laughs> also like to give a big shout out to Diane Carruthers, the assistant principal at Lehman Alternative School, where Mr. Smith met with apparently some really excited middle schoolers and high schoolers. So a big shout out to Lehman Alternative. <laughs> And finally, uh, to Tina Hodges Nielsen from New Roots School, just around the corner, where Mr. Smith met with high school students. So, <laughs> this is really, really important to get complicated topics about the Arctic and to dispel some of the mythologies and misrepresentations of the Arctic to the next generation. And on behalf of the festival and the college, we'd like to salute those principals and teachers who work so hard to make this happen. We know it is very uh, difficult to have uh, people descend onto the public schools. So thank you, Allison, and to everybody else. Um, uh, a word about this screening. Um, it is being filmed. Uh, we're filming not the film, but all the interactions Mr. Smith has with you as an audience both before and after, and I'd like to explain why. Um, as you probably know, there are incredible cuts happening at the federal level to all layers of research, uh, particularly scientific research. And if there are scientists here, you know this is um, a very troubling time. So our good benefactors at Arcus said, uh, we need to photograph Mr. Smith interacting with teachers, with community people, and with students, and with young people, so that we have some images to show to the federal government, to show that National Science Foundation dollars and Arcus dollars 
go to serving the communities in the lower 48. So by uh, letting us film today, you are helping to protect funding for filmmakers like Mr. Smith to come, artists, Inupiat artists, and other researchers to come down to the lower 48. So not only are there species that are endangered, but the science funding for bringing people here and also science funding for K through 12 and for universities is very endangered now. So we thank you for allowing us to do this. Uh, you can consider yourself part of the political struggle to keep science funding uh, available for all levels of our children in schools and our university students. So thank you for that. Um, and also thank you NSF Arcus because we can finally do a free screening for our community for the festival. So it gives me really great pleasure to introduce Mr. Smith to you today. Uh, great honor. He's been at FLEF before, and I wanted to share a little anecdote. I was a juror on the Black Mariah Film Festival and watching hundreds of films with another scholar, Scott McDonald, and my eyes were glossing over seeing all these movies. And suddenly on the screen comes an image from the Arctic. And after about 10 minutes, we said, whoa, what's this? And we asked the interns to pull out a computer and find out, because this was not a name we had heard in our kind of filmmaking circles. And after watching the film, we said, this is the top prize winner. And the people running the festival said, but you have to watch all the other films. We said, okay, yeah, fast forward for those. We're giving this one number one. This is a major, major talent and a major mind. And we had never seen nature imagery or cinematography of wildlife that looked like this. So we got the first prize. So then uh, Professor McDonald and I decided, who is this guy? Because he wasn't in our kind of documentary experimental circles. So we started Googling around. And then we did a really sneaky thing. I wrote to him and I said, hello, in my capacity as film festival director, could you send us a screener? So we did. We looked at it. I gave it to Tom Chevry, who also programs the Finger Lakes Environmental Film Festival. I said, take a look, see what you think. And he wrote me one word, whoa. Uh, and so we proceeded to get Mr. Smith uh, down here and then some other universities in the area uh, uh, joined us with it. So we consider him a close friend of Fleth. And this year he had a new film and he actually suggested, we said we don't have enough money to fly you from above the Arctic Circle down here. And Mr. Smith said, I've been named an Arcus artist. Mm -hmm. And so he actually helped us get the money to, to do this. Um, so let me tell you a little bit about Mr. Smith besides this anecdote of seeing a kind of work that just yeah. blew us away in terms of its beauty and its intensity. Uh, Mr. Smith has had a very long career as a photographer. He's worked for major photo agencies and has photographed for major publications literally on every continent. Um, he then became enamored, as he'll explain a little bit later, with uh, Alaska. He had lived in Alaska and then decided to become what he calls an embedded cinematographer director. And he is embedded above the Arctic Circle on an island uh, with his wife Jennifer Smith, who's an environmental journalist. And they are working to film the Arctic environment and polar bears like you've never seen it before. Um, I'd like to share something that uh, I was talking to my friend Allison Smith about, where she said, well, what can we say to get people interested? And here's what we say about you, Arthur. If you, have any of you ever watched the Discovery Channel, National Geo, any movie with a polar bear in it? Raise your hand. Okay, so everyone's seen a polar bear in a movie, right? then you have seen Mr. Smith's work because he is the, we call him PBG, polar bear guy. Any image you have seen of a polar bear on any television station, television program, feature film, and almost any image of the Arctic has been shot by him. And this is really a singular achievement because this is shooting in the most unbelievably difficult uh, conditions. Um, he has dedicated his life to polar bears, to the Arctic, and to reaching out to audiences like you to invite you in to this uh, last frontier so that you will uh, have the joy 
and the ecstasy of the Arctic that the Smiths have. So please join me in welcoming Mr. Arthur Smith. <laughs> I need a little bit of light here. Um, yeah, the Arctic is complicated. It's misrepresented, it's misunderstood, it's a long way away, and it's so detached from, from modern reality that it basically can be construed and represented, or misrepresented, and, and delivered to an audience in any way that see, that, that's deemed fit to serve the interests that we're doing the representing. So, um, well, we see that side of, of the reality, we're living there. I mean, this is, we live on an island that's in the Arctic Ocean, and we're three, what, 350 miles or 250 miles north of the Arctic Circle. Uh, we have polar bears on our doorstep, you know, you know so it's like, this is our reality, and, and it's like, it, it, uh, it, so what we witness, it becomes the, the actual basis of a reality that is not being communicated in a way that represents the, the, the fair disposition of how we think we're going forward and what kind of future uh, that we're going to provide for ourselves and the Arctic. So um, notwithstanding the polar bears have become like this, this the iconic symbol of the Arctic, uh, it's also inhabited by human beings. Uh, I mean, I have uh, made a lot of friends in the Inupiat village that we live in, and that I care as much about those people as I do the bears. Uh, it, you know, it's a culture that's still connected, it's still whole, that still has natural history as a part of their existence and a part of their life. And to live in that environment, to be immersed in that, and to be in, I've, I'm going on eight years now that I've lived there, um, you sense a rhythm and a balance and a peace of life that doesn't, that no longer exists in the lower 48. So in visiting my kids last night, they, they asked me, well, what's it like being back? And you know, in all honesty, I had to stop and think about it. What is it like it being back? And, and the only thing I could come up with is like, it's like being in the matrix. <laughs> you, you know, it's like going from Nebuchadnezzar and jacking in and all of a sudden being in an alternate reality because the disparity is so huge. It's so great that it's almost, ir, ir, you know, it, it's almost you know, impossible to reconcile the, the differences. So the theme that becomes the most compelling of all the threads that are in the Arctic, uh, I think, is denial. Because um, we have a tendency not to want to accept information, things, facts, science that, that kind of contraindicates where we want to be, how we want to be, and what we want to do. Um, so we don't look at them, or we ignore them, or they're not reported. But the Arctic is, is a real-time environment that reflects what we are doing and how we are doing it, and it can no longer be ignored because there's no other frontier on this planet left that represents an ecosystem like this. And and if this is compromised and we lose it, uh, then the next thing is going to be your back door. And I found this this morning to illustrate: hydrofracking, um, hydraulic fracking fluids contain toxic ingredients, millions of gallons of potentially hazardous chemicals and known carcinogens were injected into wells by leading oil and gas companies from 2005, 2009. And this is in the Wall Street Journal and Associated Press today. This is the kind of stuff that, you know, it's like, no, we can't disclose it, it's a secret. No, we can't, you know, tell you this because it's proprietary, we can't do what? When, when, when life gets in the way, is in the way of development to the extent that life is sacrificed at the expense of profit and, and in the development per se, it's the denial is no longer going to work because we're because the, it, after after this step, it's it's coming it's coming home, and we're going to be living it. So, and that's not a reality that I think that that we're we don't need to break it in order to understand what's at stake. And the other thing that relates to the film, um, a new study shows that pesticides, some already banned for decades from the U.S. market, continue to persist in homes. Chloridane, which has been banned for decades, was found in 74% of homes studied. So, you know, the chloridane issue was a polar bear issue, you know, 10 years ago. And this whole toxic drift was an Arctic issue 10 years ago. Well, we're now finding that we're all living this. 
it's not an Arctic issue, it's a, it's, a, it's a civilization, it's a human issue, and we're all bearing the consequences of where this is going. So denial doesn't work anymore. And, and this, yeah. So the projectionist came down and wants us to roll. Roll? Yeah, so the film, is, um, the film is 33 minutes, and then when it's over, Mr. Smith will come here and we'll have an audience discussion about, about the film, so. Then Ice Bears is running after this. Uh, yeah, we have to do the discussion after this. Okay. Yeah. And we will also, uh, because there's another filmmaker in here at 10 after, we'll also invite everybody after the discussion to continue the discussion in the lobby, Angela, uh, if you want to uh, continue to ask him about the Arctic. So, Hopefully we'll be able to get up there. The booth can't hear us, so. establishing shots, it's all through telephoto lenses, and it's just a matter of whether they're far enough that it's a medium shot or a, or a, a long shot or a, an extreme close-up. You know, something like that that was shot with a three or four hundred millimeter was the same focal length that I used on the close-up shots in the previous film on the slow motion sequences. That's just that now that we're shooting with a camera system that has a uh, uh, five inch or six inch LCD screen for viewfinder. So the situational awareness of being able to see the viewfinder and, and be able to fully function at the same time seeing everything else around you, where I'm a little more comfortable uh, in, in a presence that maybe when you're blindsided by, you know, a traditional electronic viewfinder doesn't work so well, so. And you have a lot of waiting to do um, well, you could say there's a lot of waiting. I mean, since the middle of November, see, I got now I got to wait all the way till you know next. I've been waiting for the bears to go out to shoot. Uh, well, this is they live there, so yeah. it's not as a matter of, of waiting. It's just living in the same space and and just being and take you know being there to experience the opportunities and film it. Um, I know that some bears are wearing collars. Who's yeah. doing the research and what are they researching for and what are they doing? <coughs> the, uh, you know, you, it's, it's not, the, it, it should be clear cut and obvious, but it isn't because we don't always get responses exactly because the village is concerned because of the collaring. There's been <coughs> numerous bears that have, that have uh, expired due to the collars being really tight. And the polar bears gain a lot of weight really fast, so if they don't release properly, um, there's issues. But uh, I think that the fact that the biomonitoring aspect of the bears, they're the canary in the coal mine. Only, only our environment and our civilization is the coal mine at this point. So to, to get a good measure of uh, the, the, the toxins that the polar bears are studied. And there, there's a, a lot of other um, uh, genetic studies that are going on but from what Canada has already is uh, is already taken a step to create and implement less invasive uh, measures of studying the bears. So that's where we're trying to advocate the same thing, because as the polar bears come to land and they're going to need land, the sea ice is melting to adversely condition or haze them away from the land when they need to be able to make the transition. Doesn't necessarily make a whole lot of sense. So. You know, so we're hopeful we can you know, sort of work together in a effective, a less invasive way to continue studying and learning what we need to know. Yes. Yeah, on that note, a very similar question. Your first film seemed to do a pretty good job of vilifying uh, radio capturing <coughs> and capturing and processing bears via helicopter. And certainly it's undeniable that helicopters are probably a really big stress on the bear. 
Um, but I think it's equally undeniable that that process is necessary to radio collar and to get that information for the pairs. Um, can you go into a little bit more in detail on those non-invasive techniques? Like I know for grizzlies, they have like hair snags. Well, that's what they're, they're looking at those kinds of things. Supporters. Yeah, supporters. A, they're looking at those same kinds of things. And, and you know, and it's, a, it's not an easy thing because there's a lot of conservation groups that are involved in sponsoring collars and, and involved with the, uh, the helicopters. But at this point, there is enough information and we know enough uh, about their behavior and the range and what's going on in that part of the world that it's like you, you could argue at this point, maybe what's in the polar bear's interest outweigh any interest that we could have. And if we're not gonna leave them alone, so they can naturally progress through a time when there's change and they need to, to make that adaptation, then what's more important, life or our need to study it? Right. Because then at a point we sort of get in the way. And, and so our interest is in more of a qualitative uh, approach to studying uh, uh, the bears rather than the quantitative because the, the whole issue about polar bear societies and, and how they interact, I mean, this last film wasn't a film about how polar bears play, it's how they learn from birth to interact and, be, and socialize and they carry that through to, to adulthood and, and you know, you know and, and to these extended families that we witness year after year and these just large groups of bears that just you know, function like small communities. So it's, uh, it's you know, you know the, uh, if the methods of study kind of interfere or break that, then, then that becomes a critical error in not, in not understanding polar bear ecology and, and the, you know, the social nature that, 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 that makes up that part of their lives, which is, gonna, which is now is gonna become more critical than ever. Because as they're forced to land and they're in groups and things, those, those bonds and, and that nature of, of the animals are, is, becomes you know, the most critical aspect. And probably the most important thing to study because without the understanding of that, then the rest of it, it's, it's like, you know, it doesn't really reflect what's, what's you know, how we need to go forward and, and with our policies and things. Another question. The other day when you were in our school, you mentioned that the Endangered Species Act um, contributes to the threat. And I was wondering, is it because of the study? Could you speak to that, how, how it well, contributes the, to the, the threat? Well, the Department of Interiors are, you know, made, when this was first announced, uh, made the statement that it, this, the, the, the Endangered Species Act was not gonna no, in no way affect uh, the development or the plans of industrialization. Um, and in that is kind of concurrent with the 30 years of study that establish and prove that the industry is no threat to the polar bears. But I don't know that there's been 30 years of offshore development at a time when climate change represents uh, the lessening of the sea ice where there was no alternative habitat. So, I, you know, look in, in going forward, we're looking at there is no alternative habitat. The sea ice is, re, you know, retreating more and more every summer. And there historically has been no presence of industrialization in a, lot, in a large section of these alternative habitats to actually know what the impact will be. So it's kind of a gross oversimplification supporting an agenda for development that sort of discounts and disregards uh, factors that are critical for actually how this ecosystem is going to move into the future. So and it, and it largely preys upon the fact that who knows any better? Who knows different? So and that's the point of what we're trying to communicate is bring the reality of, of, of what is actually going on to, to a balance and I don't know, somebody asked me, how, how are you going to affect policy? And it's like, well, if the president can't affect policy, how am I going to affect policy? We're not going to affect policy. Everybody has to do it. This has to turn back into the 60s when, you know, when enough people got together and, and you know, decided that, that, you know, this is right or this isn't right. And it, it takes people agreeing upon enough things that the politicians become, a, you know, fear for their reelection and then they respond. Well, that's the only way to... In, uh, before you mentioned hydro fracking, which is a concern that we have here, um, how is that? How does that imply to the Arctic? Or what, I wasn't quite sure what you were saying before when yeah. you mentioned uh, you, you made a couple statements about hydro fracking. 
Do you I see a connection between uh, the issues in the arts and, and hydrogen? Absolutely. I mean, the, you know, all life is connected. And what we do and how we affect life and the environment and what is reflected in polar bear studies <coughs> and toxicology and, and issues with Inupia are, you know, we're finding now that we're all being affected by the same, you know, toxicities in the environment. And, it, but, you know, in a case of, of where is that present? What's being done about it? I mean, you talk about a Nubia culture where, where they're so toxified, they could be, you know, individually. I mean, you could, you know, it's like you're quarantined. You're, you know, you could be qualified as hazardous waste. I mean, you're carrying that much of a body burden. But where, but where is that being acknowledged? Where are we dealing with it? Because this has been going on for years. And only now maybe we're finding out that we're starting to carry the same burdens. Are we, are we even going to deal with it then? Um, the USA report that came out that they're finding pregnant women are carrying these loads of toxins. I mean, do, you know, do we wait until, uh, you know, what? We break? And then we, and then we decide, well, geez, maybe we've studied enough now we know that it's not a good idea. So, the, the not, you know, the companies being let off the hook to not reveal what's, what's being injected into the ground for the hydrofracking is like, I, there's a little bit more at stake than, than corporate profits when it comes to significantly impacting the environment. And in, in the Arctic, this is kind of visible and it's forcing an issue, but we have to force it everywhere. You know, and not let that off the hook. So, as that, issue, as that article was just uh, released today, you know, I think there's probably going to be some pretty significant feedback to the fact that they've been in, you know, what they've been injecting into the ground, and it's, it's, a lot of people are going to be disappointed at what the what the truth is. So that's the connection. Okay. No, I was wondering if some, uh, when you said that, I was thinking they were injecting something up there from no. here. No. But can, can I just Show ask real connection. quickly? Um, can I just no, ask? No, real... don't mind. I need to cut this off because there's another filmmaker waiting. Okay. So we'll just ask. Um, one final question, and then we'll invite people to join Mr. Smith and our wonderful camera woman, Angela, um, in the lobby for more community discussion. And I just want to ask a, a question to bring it a little bit more back to the films we saw. Um, when we often look at images of animals, particularly polar bears, in discovery shows or on TV, um, I think what we see frequently is a lot of really rapid editing uh, with a lot of uh, exciting music that gets our adrenaline going and a lot of uh, turning animals into human families. And when I watched this film, what I really noted seeing it again, both of them, is the uh, restraint you show, the very beautiful compositions that really give a sense of the expanse of the Arctic and long, slow shots. I um, wonder if you could share just a little bit with us about like, that decision process you make in shooting the bears. Because it strikes me as so different from what we see in the commercial cable television Animal Planet style. I don't know if it's a decision much more than it is just, I, you know, that's a, it's not that it's hard to answer, but it's just like, when that's just what you do, because um, maybe it's an extent of the connection that you have, that it's just a basic, I mean, this is the way it's supposed to be, and it's either right or it's wrong, and, that's, and, and if you're disconnected, and if you come out of a cubicle in Manhattan, and you produce nature shows, maybe you don't know any better, <laughs> and maybe that's, that's what you do, because you want to feed an audience that thinks that this is what they have to have, and then you can't figure out why the stuff doesn't, why nobody watches and why the ratings go down because people know the difference and they don't like, you know, they don't respond to it. I mean, they, you know, the, the sensationalized part, it's like, you know, there's always going to be an audience for that kind of thing to a certain extent. Um, but I think the more honest and, and the more organic it is, I mean, do you, who goes to a national park to have somebody, to, you know, cut through all these things and narrate and tell you this and that and then cut, 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 cut. I mean, that's not the way people experience nature. So why, you know, why should it be different? Different with this. And, so um, I'd like to thank Mr. Smith. And I'd like to thank all of you, teachers, students, community, 
college students, FLEP interns, for joining us this afternoon. If you'd like to continue the dialogue with Mr. Smith, um, we enjoy, invite you to join us in the lobby. Please do come to the lobby. Yes, thank you. Okay, cool. We're spending the time uh, researching grizzlies. Uh, uh, polar bears, grizzlies would be a natural. Uh, yeah, we're working on some things right now. Okay. Yeah. I'm looking into going into uh, large carnivore conservation. Uh, I'm very much interested in wildlife ecology. Right now, I've been studying coyotes and muskrats. And it seems like they're like a stepping stone of animals that you have to go through before you can get to the big, <laughs> like sexy animals. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and what, what are your motivations for? Library research. Um, okay. Okay. Just to understand, you know, see how they plug in, and they're great animals. Yeah, yeah, I really like them. Thanks for the hat. I guess that's what I mean. This, you know. Yeah, I, I actually spent a couple years up in Alaska in Fairbanks, uh, guiding for Boy Scout High Adventure Base. I was oh, yeah. up there for four years. Um, the Northern Lights High Adventure Base operating out of Fairbanks, so I was in Denali National Park a lot. So okay. it, was, it was a phenomenal well, that's experience. That's grizzly territory for sure. Yeah. Yep. Yep. And uh, for me, at least, it's the grizzly is a very iconic species, and I very much believe in the trickle-down theory, where if they're healthy and their populations are provided for, that will trickle down to the lower end, you know, the species, the marmots, the uh, trophic levels below so them. It'll trickle in other, other yeah. ways, too, that haven't really been, yeah. that aren't fully understood. That's what we're working on now. Yeah. So. It's kind of an aspiration to yeah. finally sometime get out there uh, radio collaring and tracking them. Maybe maybe some non-invasive techniques that you uh, suggested too. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. Thanks. Thanks a lot. I really enjoyed your films. Thanks. Maybe just like for one minute. Thank you again for coming to our school and asking. Um, I don't know how well studied the um, different populations are of polar bears, um, and so I was wondering, like, are there efforts in the way to relocate some of the populations? You can't relocate them. They stay. They're all. They have home ranges. And they don't. I mean, there's some transient individuals, but the populations pretty much have their the place where they live. So one one if you know once that's removed, they're pretty much done. Historically, that's what's been shown to happen. That if you remove them or extricate them from a range, they don't come back. They're gone. So those that have been um, living on ice and, and aren't land polar bears, they're they're probably going to not fare very well. But I mean, you're looking at the global population. So to, to paint all of it with that brush is no, just, it, it be, that becomes the danger because the areas where they can make it become maybe the most important areas to conserve, not to conserve the riskiest, most uh, delicate part that would very well not not survive or provide that basis. But what has the greatest opportunity and historically has proven which is what we're working on now, that this is, can be documented, mm -hmm. that this has happened repeatedly. And maybe that's the area that needs the most attention and the greatest conservation. But unfortunately, that's the same area that overlaps with the greatest interest in development of the resources. So it's going to be, uh, you know, what do we want? Do you want cheap gas or do you want polar bears? Yeah. <laughs> model because they're, they co they coexist and it's a symbiotic relationship. I mean, it, you know, because they're the Inupiat or apex predators and the polar bears feed and scavenge on what they leave and then, you know, the polar bears go off on the ice so it's like a really, you know, a wonderful system where, where humans are still part of a balanced system, you know, in a way that works and functions and, and is, has been sustainable, you know, and yeah. 
So and 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 so now they're not shooting the bears there because and the bear you know so you can see by the film how things like are balanced out you know so it's become a pretty cool uh, interesting to you know evolution in that relationship just to demonstrate what's possible. So if the areas in the world where polar bears are shot and feared, you know, if this model could be studied and exported to other places in the Arctic, then we might find, well, here's a whole basis upon which, you know, things can coexist and move forward and actually have some kind of, you know, you know, bright future for, you know, moving into uh, the changes in climate that are coming, as opposed to the, you know, all the doomsday chicken little scenarios. Yeah, you focus on what's positive and, you know, not the negative. I don't believe, you know, fear and terror is being constructed, so. Oh, really? Well, thank you. Are they, are, are they seeing a lot of a lot of health effects in the Inupiat with the, with the toxic drift stuff? Yeah. I mean, what's... what's I, I mean, it's I not, just, it's not just, the subject of your film. Just Google it. it. Yeah, you'll, yeah. you'll find more than you want to know. Is, are, are they seeing, are you seeing some effects in the polar bear populations as well? <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah. Flame retardants in the Norwegian populations. And what sort of effect does that have on the birth effects? You know, endocrine disruptors in the, and reproduction cycles. and Yeah. It's all there. It's not on the front page news, but it's all there if you look. Yeah. Well, thanks, thanks again. Thanks sure. again. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks.